you know the words or the tune, feel free to join and sing or hum along with us. <clears throat> I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all beautiful Lord's Day, giving thanks for all that you have done and given to us. We ask that you watch over us as we celebrate the life of your child, Donald. Be with us as we share memories and reflections, as we laugh and as we cry. We thank you, Father, for sharing him with us for over 94 years. Today, we joyfully return him to you as we give you praise and glory for his life. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Father, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you our Lord and our Savior. Last Friday at approximately 3.30 in the afternoon, 
I became the eldest spokesperson in the group we know as the Donald Smith clan. So my sister thought it appropriate that I be the one to share some history, some memories, some reflections, since I had been with this one for nearly 70 years of his life. As she beautifully summarized in his obituary, it is quite a jam-packed story to tell. So bear with me. My trial run went kind of long, so I might cut a few things here and there. <laughs> but I've been watching the full feature film, if you will, of my 70 years of life over and over and over since she called me a little before four last Friday afternoon. Man, there's a lot of meat and potatoes there to try to squeeze into a very short session together. I title my remarks, Proud of the Name. I would like to begin my sharing with you by reading scripture from the book of Matthew. This comes from chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. It says, Do not store up yourselves for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. The word of God for the people of God. He came with nothing. He earned much. He gave away even more. And today, he returns the same as he came, having shared his entire treasures here on earth with nothing. The early years. Dad was born on March 4, 1930 to Vivian Vanita Smith. She was the middle child of Frank and Julia Ann Kelly Smith. Frank was the youngest son of 10 children born to James and Ellen Holloway Smith. James was born in 1843 and Ellen in 1845, both in the state of Ohio. They were married in 1866 and shortly thereafter, like many others, made their way, as Christus would say, west. <laughs> to settle what we now know as Eakin, Little New York, Jefferson Township, Tipton County. Making claim to the 40 acres that Cheryl references as the 40 acre farm. Frank was born in 1884, his future bride Julia Ann in 1883. They were married in 1904 and remained on the family farm. Frank's older brother, John Elmer, was still at home as well. Frank and Julia's oldest son, Russell Gale, was born on 3 March 16, 1905. Frank, Russell's father, lost his father, James, on January 21st, 1910. Grandmother Vivian Vanita came along on February 25th, 1912, followed by her younger brother Stanley Lamar on July 2nd, 1919. Frank's mother Ella remained at home in poor health until her passing on November 13th, 1927. Dad, of course, came along March 4th, 1930. I share this history for two major reasons. First, Perhaps you have seen pictures or have a memory of what the old farmhouse looked like. It was not a large home. You would go up on the front porch, knock on the front door, just walk on it if you so felt to do so, and there in front of you in the middle of the living room was the big old wood stove that provided the heat source. Right inside the door off to the right was the main bedroom. 
if you made a left, you went into the kitchen area. To the right, of course, straight ahead was the back door to the outbuildings where they stored their ice for the ice chest, ice refrigerator, pump the water, so on and so forth. If you turn to the right, you enter a little pantry room area, and then you made another right up a small stairwell to the upper story that had two bedrooms connected, one door between them. So if you were in the second bedroom, you passed whoever was dosing in the first bedroom to get to it. There was no plumbing. There was no electricity. There no, was no running water. So as you can see, Dad began his life here on Earth with very humble dreams. Second, the rich history of that 40-acre tract of land. Let's fast forward to 200, year 2000, 2020. And why the selling, the giving up, ownership was probably one of the saddest, darkest, difficult days of dad's life. School days. After birth, dad remained in the home place with Frank and Julia, or mom and pop as he called them. By the time my generation came along, she was Mim. Not sure who gave her that name along the way. Vivian, or mother, as our father referred to her, went off to Muncie to be a nanny, housekeeper, if you will, for a Tipton County friend, Harriet Nash, who was then Harriet Nelson. She was the daughter of Ray Nash, which is a very familiar name here in the Tipton County area. Grandma also did domestic work for several other families in the Muncie area. Dad told the story of how Uncle Stanley, 10 years older than himself, would drive to the bus stop at the corner of 28 and 31, which is now the side of the big, strangest roundabout system I've ever seen in my life. Pick up Mother so she could spend weekends with them. When Dad started first grade, he rode the bus to Kempton. At that time, there was a building in Kempton and a building in Goldsmith that housed all 12 grades. The dividing line in the township itself was the road that runs north and south where present day the Tri-Pond Golf Course is located. The two schools consolidated in 1944, becoming Jefferson Township Yankees. They kept the two buildings. If you were in first through sixth grade, you went to Goldsmith. If you were in seventh through twelfth, you went to Kempton. During high school, he was a member of the Jefferson Township Yankees basketball team. Upon graduation, he continued to help on the farm. He borrowed Uncle Elmer's truck and drove it to work at Triangle Inn, located on the northeast corner of the then 28 and 31. Where he pumped gas in the garage area of the facility, <coughs> There was also food in the restaurant available and a guest quarters upstairs. That happened to be the home of my cousin Jean as a youngster, his mother and dad, Eugene and Marjorie Baranowski. <clears throat> Marge was the older sister of a Roberta Louise Zimmerman. They hailed from the Uriesville, Denison, Caddis area in Ohio. <coughs> Often Roberta would travel from Ohio to Tipton County to visit and sometimes even work as a waitress in the Triangle Inn dining room. Donald met Roberta and an instant connection 
occurred. Dad then went off to serve his country in the Korean War on April 18, 1951. He returned honorable discharge home on April 9, 1953. As a son, a grandson, and now a USA veteran. The romance continued and on October 24, 1953, he gained the title of husband. He also, of course, held the title of employee. Before going to off to Korea, his mother, Vivian, married Frederick Cecil Thorpe on August 28, 1950, making him a stepson. Vivian gave birth to a daughter, Barbara Diane, on March 25, 1953, and while in Korea, Dad had added the title of Big Brother at the age of 23. Mom and Dad began their married life in an apartment here in Tipton over on Columbia Street. As he continued working on the farm, became a full-time employee of Pioneer Hybrid International, where he gained the title of farmer, excuse me, father, on August 14, 1954, when I, Michael DeWayne, was born. Cheryl Lynn followed on 6 15, July 15, 1957, so tomorrow's her whatever birthday. <laughs> Our younger brother, Don Lee, joined us on July 27, 1959. Mom had many stories about all the three of us coming during the hot months of summer. In the Tipton Hospital, pre-air conditioning days. They offered her sauerkraut and wieners for lunch on the day I was to be born. She said the smell was, and she loved sauerkraut and wieners all through her life. The family home. Dad, Mom, and I were in the apartment here in Tipton just a short time before they purchased what would become our family homestead in Goldsmith. That was their home after we, all three, were raised and had left home to be on our own. That was until their transition to Autumnwood Assisted Living in August of 2015. The home was the site of many a family gathering. One that comes to my mind is a July 4th picnic where everybody was there. The Freemans, the Smalls, the Thorpes, the Smiths. At that time in our life, Baumgartner Green, which is now a beautiful home across the street there, sold a lot of farm products, one of which was being one of the big, huge, round, galvanized metal horse tanks. That turned into a pool for us. We had a little ladder that had a little platform that would help you get in and out if you so needed the help. Well, at that gathering, my dad's first cousin, Mariana Smith Small, brought along with her her daughter, Kathy, who's a little bit older than I am. Kathy didn't realize the pool was only two feet deep, so she walked out the plank and dove in head first, scaring everybody in attendance to death. She recovered quickly, and later that night, as fireworks was shot off, she reminded us at her mother's funeral back in April. She was the one who tossed the firecracker, cherry bomb, whatever it was, went down her mother's louse <laughs> as she attempted to kill her that day. <laughs> if it wasn't a gathering at our house, we were traveling east on 28 toward Muncie to have some Sunday homemade noodles made by grandmother Vivian. Now Barbara was our aunt, but she was more like a sibling because she was only a year and a few months older than me. So the three and later four of us would be out in the apple orchard or down the road playing down the creek or doing whatever until somebody would say, get back home. Many, many times 
My dad being the workaholic that he was, you know, we'd have the lunch, he'd be back in the recliner taking a nap, and it wouldn't be any time at all while we were outside playing. We would hear the phrase, Ma, it's time to go west. We were gathering at the Baranowski's out here on, is that Lineker Acres it's called? Liner Acres on 28 back when they lived there. Mom loved playing cards. So did her sister Marge, her brother-in-law Jean, and as the kids grew, they all were right here at the table too. Hadn't been there any time at all, and there were those words, Ma, it's time to go west. I don't know which one of them had the courage. One of them spoke up and said, Uncle Buster, when she's done, we'll run her home. You go ahead. The man got up and went on home. I don't know what time the rest of us joined him. <laughs> Vacations. My dad worked and worked and worked. One thing he always did was provide us with some of the most fun-filled jam-packed summer vacations. After the busy season at Pioneer was winding down before school started. Of course, back in those days, school didn't start until after Labor Day and we were done in April because this was a farming community. I, as well as Cheryl, vividly remember sleeping in the Suburban every other night where Dad had made a platform in the back where the three of us stretched out underneath was all of our luggage and possessions. Mom tried to sleep in the middle seat and Dad would doze in the front seat. I remember one time when the state trooper pulled over in the steam windows and said, is everybody okay in there? On the rotating night, we would find a, a hotel room, motel room somewhere so we could shower and freshen up. One of my favorite memories on those trips is I think we were in the, one of the Carolinas and we're back in diaper days. John Lee was a youngster, still in diapers, and we would stop. My dad would go down the hillside as the water was flowing over a hill somewhere and wash out those soiled diapers in the cold stream below. We made numerous trips to Ohio. Faithfully, at least two times a year, my father made sure my mother made it to Ohio to visit her relatives, her roots. We went to World's Fairs, Niagara Falls, Canada, you name it. We've been so many places and so blessed. I was the first to marry on August 20th, 1977, making him a father-in-law to my wife, Catherine, who sends greetings from Florida. Tracy Sue Allen was born October 21st, 1980, making him a grandfather. Eight more grandchildren would follow. Ryan Michael was born on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1996, making him a great grandfather. Mom had to get there. It didn't matter, there was snow all over the ground, it was ice cold, and Dad took her. <coughs> over time, he would become the great grandfather of 27 more with number 28, Corey's little one, Beckett Smith, on the way, due sometime in September. When Mom first met Katie, who would become Ryan's future wife, they had an instant connection. You may recall she sang a solo beautifully at Mom's funeral in 2020. <coughs> on their wedding day, November 2nd, 2019, mom and dad were unable to come because of her failing health. But let me tell you, after her passing on April 23rd, 2020, that she was having her first chat with God, here's what she said, sitting at the throne of grace. Here's what I want. And sure enough, on February 10th, 2021, God gave us the beautiful, beautiful Delilah Rose, making Dad a great, great grandfather, a five-generational family. Little did we know at the time that they would become such chocolate buddies. 
our childhood years and as we grew. No doubt about it, one of the hardest working men I ever knew. The farm, where we had the hog operation. I don't know how many nights I would stand with my father as a new litter of baby piglets would be born. I would be there and see the sadness on his face when one of his favorite sows, the sow is the mother pig for those that don't have the agricultural background, he would have to drag out to the side of the road for the rendering truck to come by because the summer heat had taken her life. Only he and God know how many thousands of piglets were raised on that 40 acres to the weight of market weight, where we'd load them on the stock truck and ship them off to market. By 1972, he had built the herd to about 70, 75 sows farrowing two litters per year. I graduated that year and he said, son, they're yours. And I said, dad, they're yours right back because I'd like to go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Only he and God know how many of them were raised during that years of his ownership of the farm. I'm not even sure when the last one was loaded on the stock truck to be sent off to market, but over time it happened as he got older. Everyone knows he put in 30 plus years for Pioneer Seed. We visit him often, taking him dinner during the processing time where he worked at the very top of the old structure, wood structure, finishing plant. Nothing but the foundation remains today. We would climb all the way to the top of that narrow little stairway, it was at least in my childhood memory, three or four floors up to get to the top. Cheryl reminded me the other night of all the times we'd go visit. We'd be jumping and playing and horsing around in the huge bands of corn as the corn was flowing in on top of it. We all know how many people suffered and died from grain suffocation doing stunts like that. Can you imagine what OSHA and Child Protective Service <laughs> would have told him today? Mom and Dad headed up many, many detasting, deroging crews, which I, because of my age, got to be a crew foreman. We employed during the months of summer numerous Goldsmith, Kempton, other Jefferson Township youngsters showing them what real work was really all about. I think the pay at the time was $1.50 an hour. If you worked the whole season, you got a 10 cent bonus. While doing those two tasks, he continued with mom's help hauling grain in our truck to various elevators for various <coughs> farmers throughout the community. At one point in his life, he decided he wanted to be a commodity broker, so he took that job on as well. And then after retirement from Pioneer, he decided he wanted to be a volunteer at the Howard Community Hospital. I think he eventually got a paid position in the receiving part of the facility. If that wasn't already enough, he then took on the task of mowing many, many church and neighbor yards. He had customers everywhere, and as Cheryl said in the obituary, a lot of them he never charged a dime. I was a recipient of his mowing service. His many a Saturday with us, living in Morgantown, owning and operating Kathy's Cafe, <coughs> he would load up his big red mower in the back of the truck. He and mom would come and have dinner. He'd leave her at the restaurant while he went to our place and mowed the grass so mom would have time to visit with her southern Indiana grandchildren. <coughs> Dad always had this unique, uncanny, almost magical way of connecting with people. We saw examples of that today, of people who cared for him even as late as last week at the Elwood Health Facility. That's the kind of connection my dad made with people. One of those individuals was Chad Newcomb. He was here earlier today. We'll talk more about Chad in a moment. In Dad's 94 plus years of life, he had his fair share of difficult days. The passing of Pop, Frank Smith, December 4th, 1962. 
another one of those very frigid cold snow deep December days in Tiffany <coughs> County. Barbara and I can remember as youngsters the old East Union Church before they built the new one. It was at the top of the hill on this end of the cemetery. And following Pop's funeral, we were one of the kids that got to tote the flowers, the big, huge floral bouquets at that time, down the hill, slipping and sliding the whole way to Pop's burial site. The passing of mom, mem to us, Julia Smith, July 7th, excuse me, July 12th, 1968. Who can forget the July heat on the day of her service at Hills Baptist Church? The passing of his own mother, Vivian, on January 2nd, 1993. The loss of his own son, Don Lee, on May 9th, 2018. I can remember word for word when I received a call from my precious niece, Crystal Ann. And of course, the loss of his beloved Roberta during the COVID season, whom he had shared over 66 years with in the home and at Autumnwood. I was by his side Thursday, April 23rd, as she passed. I saw his grief right up close and personal. I spoke of Chad Newcomb a minute ago. When Dad started to work a little less so he could attend grandchildren and great-grandchildren events, he started leasing or renting out the tillable acres of the farm to Chad. He did that for several years. Didn't really produce that much income, but it's a way he didn't have to deal with. In early 2020, when Cheryl and Dad reached the painful conclusion that it was time to sell the farm. Remember, that land had been his ancestors for many, many years. Cheryl helped Dad through that painful process and it was a natural fit that Chad should be the one to purchase the property. Chad reached out to Cheryl just the other day to offer his condolences. And this is how he ended his conversation. Cheryl, to me, it will always be the Buster Smith farm. COVID, with all its loss and devastation, had a lot of good things come out of it. Family time, the connection time, for Tracy, Zoe, Kat, and I, it was a lot of trips to Tipton. The restaurant had been shut down by the governor March 16th. Tracy and I became real addicted <coughs> to Ancestry.com. To say the least. <laughs> Growing up and during our high school years, people will often ask her, who all here in the community of this big Smith family do you belong to? Her response was usually pretty short. Went something like this. Well, the Baranowski boys are our cousins. That's about it. Our moms are sisters that came here from Ohio. Of course, we knew where folks like Pop and Mom and Uncle Russell and Aunt Goldie and Uncle Stanley and Aunt Irene were laid to rest. <coughs> But Ancestry allowed us to connect with so many more, like Grandfather James and Grandmother Ellen. So many more had traveled west and settled here. The list of ancestors kept growing and growing, and we now know that many, many of our and your ancestors are laid at rest at Arch Small Cemetery 
which is west of Union Cemetery, about a mile back off the road. Union, Hills Baptist, Fairview, Teetersburg, Normandy, just to name a few. One of those trips was in June of 2020. We toured the farm, enjoying our pre-packed lunch. We were actually trespassing because the farm no longer belonged to the Smith family. Because the cell to Chad was complete. We made our way through the brush and the rubble and the great big huge monstrous trees that I remember in my day being about this big and now they're like covering over the whole area where the outbuildings and the family home. But we made our way through there and little by little I was describing to my daughter and my granddaughter that's where the chicken coop was, that's where the pump house was, those are the three buildings that the sows were housed in. The house itself had pretty well collapsed by then. The roof was laying right on top of the first floor. And one of the things that treasures my daughter is she went around treasure hunting were some of the shingles that had been on that home for God knows how many years. The shingles that had protected that man as a youngster. Cheryl asked her people to bring things to add to the casket. A small piece of shingle I give to my dad that it might continue to protect him, protect him in the rest of his journey here on the wall. She found all kinds of things. Brian was, of course, excited when we got home because that was more junk. <laughs> Try to find a place more in the corner of the garage. We found some rocks from the big old rock pile. Cheryl probably remembers that because, you know, when you'd be out there plowing the fields, you had to pick up all the big rocks and bring them to the rock pile so they didn't tear up the equipment. We gathered the shingles that I mentioned. Trace even found one of Mim's old iron skillets buried in the rubble beside what remained of the kitchen cook stove, where many, I'm sure, a delicious meal had been prepared by Julia Ann. As I said, she took these treasures in the trunk of our car home, and she made a beautiful, beautiful flower garden in front of her and Brian's home that were odds and ends that belonged to Frank and Julia Ann. The final years. After mom's passing, Cheryl took dad to as many events as his health would allow. Baseball games, birthday parties, Barb and Greg's 50th wedding anniversary celebration. Our grandson, Tracy's son, Jacob's football games at Franklin High School against Whiteland just to name a few. Sometime early in 2022, Dad said to me once in conversation, either I was with him or over the phone, I sure would like to visit my mother's grave site just one more time. So I think it was around the July 4th holiday that chauffeur Tracy loaded us southern folk in her van we headed north toward Tipton. We picked up Cheryl. We picked up Dad. We headed east on 28 toward Eaton. Dad didn't say much on the trip. It's about 40, 45 miles over there. He just kind of gazed out the window, probably reminiscing about years gone by. Barb met us there at the Gardens of Memory on Highway 3 south of Eden. Tracy parked the van as close to the grave side as we could get it without damaging the grass and we all helped him make the way through the very thick grass there at Memory Gardens. We'd taken along a bar stool. We put it under him for support. Barbara put her arm around him, and the rest of us stood back while the two of them shared time together with their mother. We headed west. We took him to Petersburg, 
We spent time with Mom and Don Lee. We continued further west and south toward Little New York. We then turned east toward the Smith homestead. The trees, the brush, the house, the outbuildings, and all those things my daughter and granddaughter witnessed for their first visit ever at the family farm were now gone. The Newcombs had methodically disposed of, buried, whatever. We paused briefly and took in the beauty of the beans that were about this tall by then that covered the soil that was once his home. We continued east toward Union Cemetery, parked as close as we could to Pop and Mom's grave, looked from afar as we knew his weakened body was past the point of assisting him to their grave site. By now we knew after a long day he was tired and had reached his limit. So we headed back toward Tipton, returned him to Autumn the place he now called home. Preparing for the end. Last fall, I ended up with two broken teeth. The first one, a piece of white meat chicken breast. The second one, some peanut brittle from Bucky's that my sister and my wife had brought home to me in their latest trip to Florida. Both of those broken teeth, I thought I just lost part of the cabinet, of the filling. Both of them required crowns. That's not cheap, let me tell you. Especially when you do them back to back. Well, I always made my appointments at eight, visit with my friend Regina back there, who's employed at Smith Dentistry. I would stop at 7-ish. I'd leave early from Morgantown so I could get here and share breakfast with him while he was still going to the dining room. When he finished, we made our way up the elevator back to his room and he sat on the couch behind his walker as he often would do. We visited for a little while more and I said, I better get headed over. It's almost 8 o'clock and he said, yes, you should. And as I got ready to go, he started to stand up, supporting himself on the walk. I said, are you needing to go to the bathroom, Dad? And he said, no. And with his arms stretched out, he said, I love you. The first time in my 69 years that I had ever had my father say those three simple words to me. Over the last few months, he's made several, several trips to the hospital. In between one of those, his sister Barbara, her husband Greg, came over to visit. And all of these many years as a big brother, her now being 70, because she's a little older than me, he has announced to those in attendance wherever they were, this is my stepsister, Barbara. Half-sister, excuse me, half-sister, Barbara. Is this another one of those edits we go sessions like you all had the other one? <laughs> someone came in the room or they passed someone in the I don't know exact location, she can fill you in on the details. My father, Speaking to the person said, this is my sister, Barbara. Needless to say, just like me, she left the facility in tears. Crystal Lynn, one of the most faithful in the room to go visit him in Ottawa and take her two, uh, two young sons with her. Always the last words out of her mouth. Papa, Grandpa, whatever the term they used, I love you and away they'd go. But on a recent visitation, her usual I love you came out and what he say back? I love you too. Cheryl Lynn, he said to her not too long ago, I don't know why you are trying so hard, 
to keep me alive. She kindly replied, Dad, because it's not lawful for us to euthanize you like we do. <laughs> Several times as she has spent these final weeks with him, he has said to her, I love you. The final weeks. Tracy and her being on Ancestry.com and researching our ancestors would often see the name Tina Freeman, picture posted by Words pictured by, posted by Tina Freeman. Tina was one of the four children of Dad's first cousin, Vanna Lois, sister of Mariana. They were both children of Russell and Goldie. Anyway, Tina, with her married name attached, Tracy and her made this Facebook connection. And after seeing the name on many, many of Tracy's ancestors, she said to Tina, I think we're related. Sure enough, Tina confirmed, yes, we are. Kathy Small, that I talked about cracking her head in our two-foot pool, also Facebook friends with her cousin, Tina, asked Tina, who is this Tracy person that you're always talking about? Tina says back, that's Bussy's granddaughter. And on March 8th, 2024, Tina reached out to her and said, <laughs> Aunt Mariana has passed because Tracy had told her dad wants to know when it happens. He wants to come. He wants to bring dad if it's possible. We took dad to Mariana Smith Small Llewellyn's celebration of life. Once again, Tracy being our chauffeur as we loaded him up. Pants falling down as he made his way from the front door to the van, but you know by now he's nothing but a toothpick. And Cheryl kept getting smaller belts and smaller belts and smaller belts. And my wife Catherine and Tracy yells out the window, Grandpa's pants are falling down. <laughs> we took him to Kokomo for her celebration of life. We brought him back. We then traveled to Union Cemetery. <coughs> where Marianne is laid to rest beside her husband, Donald. Donald was a classmate of Dad's, class of 48. I cannot count the times that Kathy, from her home in Michigan, has thanked her so many times for bringing him to the funeral. After a not so pleasant stay, when he moved from Autumn Wood over to the New Waters, which was no longer the old Millers or Mother again, Cheryl, against medical advice, jerked him out one night, took him to her house. <laughs> Days later, she got the call from the state, Adult Protective Services, questioning, how dare you, you know, this was against medical advice. She responded, you don't want me to even go there. The sights and sounds I witnessed every time I visited that facility. My dad's now at the facility in Elwood, Elwood Healthcare. The person on the other phone thanked her for her time and said the case is closed. Yeah, she had taken him over there with Catherine's help on Friday, April 19th and moved him in. On April 20th, Saturday, Tracy again came up bringing her granddaughter, our great-great-granddaughter. Great-granddaughter, it's his great-great, Delilah Rose. She brought along two little Hershey chocolate candy bars. They were supposed to be for Pat Wall. She hands him one. Hangs on to the other. Tracy says, isn't that other one for Papaw too? I think I'd like to have one. He smiles at her and says, that's okay, hon, we'll share them together. April 20th, this was the condition of our father. 
one of my father's favorite things to do was to attend the Jefferson Township Alumni Banquet each June, the first Saturday. It's an organization of alumni that went to school in Jefferson Township that raises money to provide scholarships for students of Tipton schools who are descendants of Jefferson Township attendees and or graduates. Once again, Cheryl knew she was going to be tied up with her numerous grandchildren playing ball games from Edinburgh to Noblesville to wherever all else they go. She said, can you take him? I said, sure, I'm planning on going myself because that's when I reconnect with a lot of my classmates who are here today. Sent my form in, she sent hers in, his in, I'm sorry. Well, now that he's in Elwood, and that's more Kyle's territory, Kyle was checking on him quite often, so Mom didn't have to make the 16-mile trip over there on a daily basis. The entire week prior to the banquet on Saturday evening, June 1st, my father sat there with his shoes on, ready to go. Kyle would stop in and check on him. In conversation, he would say, well, Kyle, I guess Michael got too busy to come get me. And Kyle continually reminded him, no, Grandpa, he hasn't forgotten. This is only Tuesday. The banquet's not until Friday, Saturday, excuse me. Kyle reassured him several times that week, but he kept the shoes on. So on Saturday evening, June the 1st, my chauffeur and my granddaughter Zozo came with me to assist in getting him to the banquet. We took him back at the conclusion of the alumni banquet that Saturday evening, still raining. The nurses came out and assisted us unloading him and getting him back to his room, and they proceeded to put him in bed. The last three things my father said to the two of us, thank you for taking me to the banquet. Thank you for taking me to the banquet. Thank you taking me to the banquet. That gathering of friends and classmates each year was so important to my father that he literally willed himself to make it to that banquet. The final hours. Sunday morning, the nursing facility contacts my sister. Well, while we had had him at the banquet the night before, numerous times he said to Tracy and I, my back is really hurting. And we would try to shift him in the wheelchair and make him comfortable. Two minutes later, my back is really hurting. Of course, at the banquet, he ate nothing. He smiled at friends, shook hands with some friends. Zozo went back to the banquet line a second time and grab three more dinner rolls. And as hard as she tried, Pat almost drink one of these. A couple sips out of a glass of ice water is all we get him to take. So that call came Sunday morning. We're talking just hours after us dropping him off from the alumni banquet. And says your father has taken a serious decline overnight. We soon learned the reason for the back pain on his upper back, lower back, upper rear area was a spot about this big that in technical terms they call the Kennedy ulcer. If you Google it, it will tell you politely. The Kennedy ulcer is the death ulcer. Those in the nursing profession know that that is the first sign of the death process is already underway. So she texted me, I was already at church, it was about 10, and she, she said, I know you're probably already at church, but. Well, my chauffeur and the gang, we were coming north again because Krista's Blaze was gonna celebrate graduation from Hamilton Heights High School the night before. So we knew we were coming, but I called her and I said, I think at best, I go on, I'll meet up with you, Krista's, later. And when I walked in his room, 
I could not believe what I saw before my eyes in one short 10, 12 hour period. I talked earlier about that magical connection. Man, did he ever have that with some of the staff at Elwood Assisted Nursing Care. During the course of the week, Cheryl and I met several of them. A lot of times they would report for their shift, they might be assigned somewhere else in the facility and they begged, they pleaded, or they coerced a coworker to switch because they wanted to be at the nurse's station across the hall from room 308 where my father was. So during that time, he got a new name, Poppy. One of the girls would lean down and say, Poppy, how you doing? Poppy, it's time for your medication. And he would smile and grip their hand with all his might. That magical connection he had. Like me, I'm sure several of you who visit during the course of the week would see often the activity room dining area. A nice, sweet lady with long white hair in her wheelchair, sitting at the table with a big flat screen TV in front of her with her dinner plate that was probably now three, four hours old as they ate and come in and try to get her to take one more bite. Thursday evening, I had made my way up. Trace and I were going to come together, but she was at work in Bloomington, and Cheryl had said, they're saying this might be the time, so I came on without her, and she came and joined us later. Before her arrival, Pat had come and joined up with us, and Cheryl and Pat had gone off to the local Wendy's there and got them a small bite to eat, and they brought back for me a delicious chicken, what kind of chicken something salad, anyway. had bacon, and it was good. <laughs> well, rather make a mess, all you know, trying to eat it, I went to that room where there was that lady. And of course, we all week long had heard her in a mumbling to somebody. There wasn't anybody else in there with her, but she was talking to somebody. While eating my salad, I heard her say over and over in her chair, I have nobody. I have nobody. I have nobody. And I said to myself in that moment, that poor soul in her state of dementia, Alzheimer's or whatever else she was dealing with, was speaking from those lips the absolute truth as so many in those facilities are in that same situation of having nobody. In my dad's case, he can't say that because he has all of you. I want to give out some thank yous. My sister, first of all, because she's been dealing with this story since August of 2015. I want to thank the old millers because a lot of them are still working at the waters. I want to thank the folks at Autumnwood, Elwood Health and Living, I want to thank my niece, Crystal Lynn, I'm not Chris, I'm sorry, Courtney Lynn, as she was at his bedside. <laughs> Praying him away as the music played in the background as he passed on to the next life at 3.30 Friday afternoon. I want to thank the folks here at Nichols, the way they assisted my sister and I at Don Lee's passing, the way they assisted mom was the first drive-by viewing during the season of COVID. Some of our groups still have scars from the sunburns they acquired while they were out there tailgating on the other side of our town. In closing, all the times we heard, let's go west, Ma. Today, it is her saying, let's go west, Pa. Come lay your tired, weary bones down beside mine and Don Lee's at Petersburg, and let your spirit and your soul soar high to the heavens. Come, let's sing 
and dance and celebrate. You, me, and Don Lee, and your many ancestors that have gone before you. I am so, so, so proud of the name. Amen. I now call upon my great nephew, Kyle Comer, who wants to offer a few words. Don't worry, I can assure you, mine is much, much shorter. <laughs> Let me see you try, Gemini. <laughs> <laughs> Beloved husband, brother, son, father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather, farmer, army corporal, soldier, veteran, and friend. Known as Buster to many, hard worker, stubborn as an ox, as we definitely saw in his last week of life. Grumpy most of the time, but a man whose love for others was carried out in action and with very few words. To me, he was Grandpa. He was always there, always intimidating as hell, but loved his grandchildren dearly. Not once did he ever lay a finger on me, but he didn't have to. Something about his demeanor demanded my respect. And a simple raise of his voice would snap me right back into place. Most of the time it was because Tyler was with me and he was getting us into trouble. <laughs> I spent many weekends and summer nights at his house, and most of my one-on-one -on -one time with just him and I was out helping others, just like we talked about earlier with mowing lawns. It seemed like we were always going to someone's house that he either knew from the church or from working at the hospital at the time, and we were going to help out, usually as an elder person's yard, and he never took a dime out of that. A true example of the servant's heart. Him and Maul made it to every ball game, every birthday party, every milestone in my young life. Most of my sports memories are of, of him yelling at referees or umpires at every game, and his voice carried across every gym or ball field that we were at. For example, I never played high school ball. Nick did. He sat at the very top of the Tipton gym, but it didn't matter. You could still hear him <laughs> everywhere in the gym. So many of my memories of Grandma and Grandpa that I cherish the most now brings me a smile to my face because they are so different than the times that we're living in now. Riding in the back of a camper shell on a mattress all the way to Tennessee. If I had to pee, I would knock on the camper shell window. <laughs> Grandpa, I got to pee, and we'd pull off on the side of I-65 right there and pee on the side of the road in the middle of the night. I was about 22 or 23 years old, sitting in a merit board interview for the Carmel Police Department. One of the questions the board members asked me was, who is one person in your life that I admire the most? Why and what kind of impact have they had in your life? I'd never been asked that question directly before, so I hadn't really put too much thought into it. I just knew that there was the list of my long of people that had influenced my life and, and it impacted me. But I was in an interview, so I had to quickly come up with a response. And the first thing that came to my mind, I responded, my Grandpa Smith. Sorry, I lost my place in my... Um, And that was the most genuine person I could immediately think of. It maybe took me two seconds to come up with that. I went on to describe how he was the strongest and one of the most hardworking individuals that I had ever met. A true example of grit and compassion for others. I watched him always doing for others and rarely doing for himself. His family was everything, and though he worked his ass off, he never put anything above his family. I also admired his military service his sacrifices to our nation during one of our nation's most nastiest and ugliest wars in our history. One of my funniest memories, which he did not find funny at all, but to me it was hilarious, um, it was probably 12 or 13 years ago. I was early on in my career and Jess and I went out to Goldsmith to visit. This is prior to us having children. Sitting in his front room, Grapple proceeds to explain to me that, to his police officer's son, that he had just been arrested for driving without a license. And again, he did not find that funny, I did. <laughs> 94 years young, around 82-ish back then, still never had a valid driver's license, which was... Oh, okay. 
so he let it expire. But he had a long time. And, and long BMV time. history that I could look back at, he'd never had a license. <laughs> a long time. So I knew he'd been driving around the farm since he could probably barely see over the steering wheel, driving to vacations all over the country without this license. So he was a nervous wreck to go into court. And, he, and I said, Grandpa, well, there's no judge in the world that's going to sentence an 87 year old man to jail. You're, you're going to be just fine. But I recommended that he study for the test and get a valid driver's license so that way he could show the judge that he now had a valid driver's license. So I watched him for a couple of weeks, study this BMP manual in his 80s, and he got so irritated by it that he just gave up and said, screw it. So <laughs> then he gets put on probation, and he was pretty good for a little while. He went maybe six months, a year, probably while he was on probation, let them all drive back and forth. And then his stubborn butt got right back behind the wheel and continued on driving again. Probably one of my most admirable things about him was watching him care for his bride. Especially in her last years, he never left her side and truly lived out his vows in his sickness and in health. His life is one of honor and made more of an impact on me than I can ever put into words. I find peace knowing that there was a large heavenly meeting with him last Friday and his bride and he's re reunited with grandma and many loved ones that have gone before him. Rest, rest easy grapple until we meet again. At this time we would offer an open invitation to anyone the spirit has moved to share words. Spirit has moved. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Oh, I'm giving an invitation. <laughs> an invitation to anyone else. Chad will, of course, be sharing more at the graveside later. And we have military rights as well. So, seeing no one, my sister Cheryl has some words she would like to offer. Now, luckily, I can start out keeping it kind of funny because Kyle telling the story about dad and grandpa actually we never knew that until Pat and I was married he did have it sometime I have no idea when but he did have a license but Pat and I was headed down to my sister-in-law's house for Thanksgiving in Plains Plainsville, Plainsville. <laughs> and we're dry <laughs> did we actually see him that day Remember? Okay, so anyway, <laughs> he, we were on 465. We was in a separate vehicle, and he had pulled on the wrong exit. He meant to go down to 40, but he got on 65 and was headed towards Chicago and realized it. So he starts backing <laughs> down to try to get back in the correct way. That's when we found out that he didn't have a license. And he continued to not have a license for many, many years, even though he does have a, son, a grandson and a grandson-in-law that are police officers that try to enforce those things in people. But we often refer to life as the circle. For myself, how true these words were. My parents raised me, I raised mine, and shortly after that, I started the journey of caring for my parents and helping with my brother. Through this process, I realized just how strong I needed to be and in turn was. My mom taught me my sweet calm self and my dad, well, he taught me that I needed to be feisty and sometimes meant even with him. Although challenging at times, I would not have traded it for the world. When he was staying with Pat and I for 10 days to my, with my sister-in-law's help, his sweetness started coming to light with a thank you on just about everything that I did. Those are the memories that I would hold in my heart forever. For me, thankfully, the staff at Elwood Health and Living got the sweet side of him the last eight weeks of his life, and he became poppy to all of them. So as I say goodbye to you today, Dad, I remember that how sweet of a person you really, truly were. I love you, Paps. Anyone else? We will close this time of sharing together with my great nephew, right Krista. Oh, Krista has a reading to share. You didn't share give, last year, you didn't give me that signal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Road to eternity. Life is but a stopping place, a pause in what's to be. 
a resting place along the road to sweet eternity. We all have different journeys, different paths along the way. We all, we all were meant to learn some things, but never meant to stay. Our destination is a place for greater than we know. For some, the journey's quicker, for some, the journey's slow. And when the journey finally ends, we'll claim a great reward and find an everlasting peace together with the Lord. After Chad's closing prayer, the staff here at Young Nichols will do the necessary things of allowing us time to say our goodbyes. We would hope you would join the procession to the Tetersburg Cemetery following that service with military rites. Join us for time and fellowship as we break bread together and celebrate this 90-year-old man's life. Thank you for being here today, Chad. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for the, the long, hard, honorable life that, grandfather, that Grandpa Smith lived, Lord. We thank you so much for the example that he led by. We thank you so much for the legacy that he leaves behind. Father, we thank you for uh, the way that you guided him and the way that he's guided us. Father, we lift him to you now. As we get ready to lay his body to rest, we know, Lord, that he's in your care, he's in your arms. And Father, we know that uh, he's in a better place. Father, we pray that you comfort and uh, just protect each and every one of us, each and every one of us through this day. Help us to be at peace and process this as we move forward. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, just continue to guide us in the days ahead as we uh, travel this road uh, without the glue that help kind of hold this family together. But Lord, we know that he's here with us in spirit as we continue to, to go forward through life. And his legacy of the many lessons that he's taught us will be deep-rooted in our hearts as we continue to move forward. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with the rest of the service. We pray that you would help uh, bring us together for fellowship and just uh, celebrate, Lord, the 94 years that we got to enjoy him. Thank you for that time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Another comrade has joined to his reward. The Supreme Commander has called him from this battle line and ordered him to report to his command, mindful of service nobly done. He has told comrade Donald Smith to join him in the ranks of everlasting peace. Because our, his comrades have gathered here at this final battle line on earth to honor their devotion and honorable service to our country. Because of Donald Smith and his many comrades, all of our lives are free. Because of them, our nation lives. Because of them, the world is blessed. We will now bestow the highest honor government has for its fallen veteran. May the ceremonies of today deepen our residence for the party Commander, we done the salute. What? It's cut. Port arm. Ready. Aim. Fire. Aim. Fire. Aim. Fire.
United States, the United States Army, and the Grateful Nation. Please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. Dearly beloved family and friends, we gather here today to honor, to remember, and to celebrate the life of this very special man, Donald Smith. He was known by many different names and held many different titles. Don, Donald, Buster, Smitty, Pa, Dad, Grandpa, great-grandpa, big papa, great-great-grandpa, just to name a few. I had the distinct honor of calling him Grandpa Smith. In this moment of sorrow and reflection, we come together in faith and love, offering our prayers and support to each other. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you in our time of grief and sadness, seeking your comfort and strength. We ask that you grant us peace as we remember Dawn and the profound impact that he had on our lives. Be with us now as we celebrate his long life and commit his soul to your care. Amen. Before I begin, I have some lovely cousins that would like to share. Bless us with with a with a song. In peace like a river attend my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. the opportunity, the incredible opportunity, a short few years ago to sit and speak with my Grandpa Smith about his faith. All who knew Grandpa knows he was a man of few words, so the conversation didn't last long. But in this discussion, he confessed to me that he would accept Jesus into his heart, which brings me much peace today as we get to not only celebrate this incredible life that he lived here on earth, but we also get to celebrate the eternal life that he has ahead in heaven. The Bible says in John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus told her, speaking of Magdalene, Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, Martha on this one side, uh, I am 
am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. The last few months has been incredibly difficult to watch. One of the toughest men that I've ever known slowly become weak and struggle to get out of bed. I found peace with Grandpa's transition from his weak and worn out earthly body by reading the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we we are eagerly awaiting for Him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like His own, using the same power with which He will bring everything under His control. As many of you know, in 2020 I was blessed with the opportunity to take over Donald and Roberta's homestead that they spent their adult life enjoying. This process of remodeling was a process of healing for me. Healing from the loss of a dear, dear grandmother. I was going through a fresh divorce process of allowing God to make beauty rise up from the ashes, making all things new. Today, the same process we celebrate over Grandpa as his old body is being made new. As we gather here to say our goodbyes, I'm filled with memories of a man who embodied unconditional love, generosity, servanthood, a passion for his family, kindness, and at times a little laundriness. My grandpa Smith was more than just a family member. He was the glue that held us all together, a mentor, a guide, and a source of unwavering support. A man of few words, so when he would speak, we all knew it was worth listening to what he had to say. He was never afraid to speak up if he felt there was something that needed to be said. And there was never any sugarcoating. His wisdom and warmth touched everyone he met. And his legacy of compassion and generosity will live on in all of us as we go forward. Grandpa was a simple man who didn't need or want much to be content and happy. I believe he chose his life chose to live a simple life so that he was able to bless others with more. He would give the shirt off his back if he saw someone that needed it. I've heard many stories of how Grandpa and Grandma would feed the hobos that came in off the train when the elevator was running in Goldsmith and the trains would stop. Many times did he clear snow from the streets of Goldsmith so all the residents could get around with this old John Deere 4020. He mowed many yards for those who couldn't do it for themselves over the years. And the list goes on and on on the selfless acts of kindness he performed. His legacy of servanthood and compassion for others is how I desire to live. Although he had a big and soft heart for others, Buster was one of the hardest working and toughest dudes that I've ever met. It wasn't uncommon for him to get home from work, to get right to work around the farm, the house, or the garden. As hard as he worked, he also believed it was very important to take at least one family vacation a year, as Mike brought up in the service in town. I believe he kind of used the same mindset that I do. We work hard so that we can play hard. And he did like to play hard. He and Grandma were not afraid to act like kids go on the same adventures as the kids and the grandkids. This is another legacy that has been passed along. So I'm sure Pat can attest to how Cheryl loves to live. <laughs> <laughs> I remember many lessons he imparted and the unconditional love that he always gave. Whether it was through his quiet strength or his gentle humor, 
He had a way of making each of us feel special and cherished. He was a devoted family man who never hesitated to do anything he could to help us. He will be deeply missed, but his legacy will carry on for many years to come. Let's say a close the prayer here. Father God, we entrust Don to your merciful care. Grant him eternal rest and let perpetual light shine upon him. Comfort those of us who mourn and give us strength to carry on with faith and hope. We thank you for the gift of his life and for the memories we will hold on to forever. Amen. As we prepare to lay Grandpa to rest, we do so with the hope of, re of the resurrection and eternal life. The sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to the Almighty God our Grandpa Don, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. May the Lord bless him and keep him. May the Lord make his face to shine upon and be gracious to him. May the Lord show Don favor and give him peace. Let us go forth in peace in the peace of Christ, holding on unto the love and memories of Grandpa Smith. May God bless each one of you and give you strength in the days ahead. Grandpa, as we mentioned in town, Mike brought it up and uh, Krista posted on her Facebook. One of Grandpa's favorite sayings was, Are you ready to go west, Ma? When it was time for him to feel like leave whatever party or event he was at. When he was ready to leave. So today, we get to, uh, Grandpa, we get to turn that back to you home. We get to bring you home out west. Next to your lifelong bride and your son. Rest easy until we meet again. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as family and friends and celebrate the wonderful life of Donald Smith. Father, we pray that you bless this time of food and fellowship and the breaking of the bread, and we pray that, Lord, we would be able to celebrate all the memories that we have of Don and the impact that he had on our lives. Pray that you would be with us through the rest of the day and get us all home safely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.